afternoon, you'll be hearing from Pete Cashmore, CEO and founder of Mashable. And facilitating the discussion will be his CTO, the CTO of Mashable, Robin Peterson. Uh, Robin, of course, leads all technology for Mashable. He's also been instrumental in launching technology for media companies for the past decade at such companies as Next Issue Media, NBC Universal, Ziff Davis, and Juno. He's a member of the advisory board for Parsley Inc., which is a content uh, analytics company, and he has climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. That's her fun fact. So please do welcome Robin Peterson. Do you want me to come on too? Are you going to yeah, sure. me? Hey, everybody. It's a great crowd here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Robin, the CTO at Mashable, uh, and I run what we call the, uh, the product team. So that is design, product management, and engineering. Um, and sitting to my right is Pete Cashmore, our CEO and founder. How are you doing, Pete? And I'm just Pete. <laughs> just Pete. Um, so I, I joined Mashable uh, about two years back when um, Pete and I uh, decided that we wanted to, uh, in a sense, build a product expertise, expertise at Mashable uh, and really kind of double or triple down on technology. And the first question that I had uh, for you, Pete, was why do you feel that new media companies need a product expertise? Why, why do they need to be good at engineering? Sure, so I think what's changed about um, media is really the consumption methods, right? I mean, obviously, Mashable kind of rose on, on the popularity of social media, people consuming headlines in different ways on Twitter and Facebook and so on. Now we've seen the, ro the rise of mobile, people consuming our stories completely differently than how they used to consume them, and we need to build for every screen, right? So you can have the greatest content in the world, but if people can't actually get to it when they want to read it, if they can't read it on their phone or their iPad or uh, the hundreds and hundreds of devices that they're reading on now. I think every month Mashable gets consumed on over 3,000 devices yeah. or so. We might even be up to yeah. 3,500. So um, people need to be able to consume your content wherever they are. And creating great content is problem number one, but then making sure that uh, that content can be consumed everywhere is obviously problem number two that you have to solve. So uh, for us, you know, having great technology that works in every device is really, really important. So I, I think I have one of, the, one of the most exciting devices here which is Google Glass. There you go. So you just wanted to do the reveal. I, I wanted there. to pull it on. You just like ta-da. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Glass, take a picture. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I, I, the reason I'm putting this on uh, is because we actually built a Glass app we that did. we that we just released at Google I/O. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So. We wanted to build a, an app for this Google Glass. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we didn't want to just do, OK, here's all the Mashable stories, because there's a couple things when you start using Google Glass. One of them is that you notice that you could quickly get bombarded with updates. They're right there on your eye. You don't want every single story. Um, so we wanted to create an experience that you know, gives you the most important stuff on the social web. So what we did was we built, um, uh, we call it Velocity for Glass, which essentially will show you which stories are really taking off on the social web, which ones are going viral before they go viral. So it uses predictive technology to say, uh, this is what people are going to be talking about today. Uh, so you get it early. It pushes maybe a couple stories a day, maybe yeah, three right. or so. Right. Um, and you can read them out as well. Uh, you get a little summary that can read out in your ear. Um, so it's pretty fun stuff, and we were pretty excited to see it uh, working. But last week, and, and we're actually up to uh, what we believe is about 15% of all glasswares actually have the Mashable 15%, app installed. That's 15%. Good. If we can go to the next slide, um, there you go. So, if you're, of course, we had to do it with a dog or a cat or, or a pug or something. But uh, so, if, if you authenticate with the Glass app, this is the first screen that you'll see, which tells you that you've, you've installed the app. Uh, and then, like Pete said, whenever we detect a story that is going viral or actually more, more accurately, about to go viral. Uh, and what we see is that our prediction engine, Mashable Velocity, actually is able to predict it going viral about four hours before it actually does go viral. So in the past, we've just shown this to our editorial team, but now to wearers of Google Glass, you'll actually get an alert that tells you uh, this story is about to go viral, which is really fun. But it, it kind of gets back to the point that um, uh, you know, we want to build Mashable to be able to adapt and respond to every device size. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So he, here's our home page, Pete. So tell us when we, you know, when you and I got together and really went through what we wanted before, before, you, before we even talk about this design, 
you know, what, what were some of the some of the driving themes for for this for this design? Sure. So there's a few things that are changing in media. Um, obviously, this mobile. Obviously, the social, which is just that that's a new way of ranking your stories. Um, but there's also this visual trend, which we're really aware of. Like our stories used to get shared on Twitter and Facebook a great deal. And it used to be like a headline, an extract, but now it's all about imagery. And people are pinning our stories a huge amount. I mean, we have a million plus Pinterest followers. They pin the images from each story. They pick certain images. They curate them. They create their own list and stuff. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is make sure there's great, huge, high-res imagery on every story. And that that imagery would resize to be the perfect resolution for every device, right? So that was one of the leading things. It's social, mobile, and visual, and making it work across those three things. Uh, so where we ended up, obviously, is with um, not only has this you know, got huge high-res imagery for every story, but we also rank stories by social. So Velocity, which is our algorithm which predicts like, what's about to go viral on the web, bump stories up after about 15 minutes to the middle column. And then as they become the hottest stories of the day, they move over to the right column so that, you know, in one look, you wake up in the morning, you can say, OK, here's what was hot, here's what I missed. Uh, you, know, you wake up on a Monday, you've missed the whole weekend. Uh, you can check out what's hot, what's going to be hot for the rest of the day, and what the new stuff is as well. So that was really the thinking behind it, is make it really easy to uh, consume what's important, essentially curate the news using social filters, and um, make it work on every single device. Because you know, when I wake up on Monday morning, it's going to be on my phone. It's, I'm not going to like instantly have my laptop open and, and going through stories. So uh, that was really the thinking behind it. It's great. Um, you know, a, f a funny story. So as Pete mentioned, we use Velocity to lay out uh, the entire home page. And what we say internally is that the Mashable home page is 95% algorithmically driven, which means, as Pete mentioned, Velocity moves articles uh, from left to right on the, on the page, finally ending up in the what's hot column, depending on where the velocity algorithm predicts they're going to go uh, engagement-wise. And that's by crawling Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter and, and a lot of other places, uh, which is pretty interesting. But um, one, one, one interesting aspect to this is we not only crawl Mashable content, but we also watch the engagement of articles just across the web. Uh, and this, this kind of changes our business a little bit, right? Um, it allows us to have some visibility uh, uh, just across the social web and really get a jump on what's happening next. And in fact, uh, when we were just testing uh, the Velocity algorithm out, when it was alpha testing, it was Pete and, and myself and our chief architect. And when we released the crawlers, it came back and told us that the Facebook page, let me see if I can get this right, the Facebook page for Walmart in Kodiak, Alaska was the first thing that it predicted would go viral. So we, you remember that? It actually thought the, the algorithm, we actually thought the algorithm was broken. So there's, there's no way that this particular page is going to go viral. Uh, and this was back, back this summer, if anybody remembers. Um, it turns out three days later, we found out actually by reading, by reading our own site uh, that, the, uh, that Walmart had a contest where they told the audience, to the, pu the public at large, that they would send the hip hop artist Pitbull to any location in Walmart that got the most likes. Uh, and the internet hates Pitbull. So they liked the Kodiak, Alaska Walmart being the most remote. Um, and of course, he was a sport and, and went out there. But that actually showed us that it's, uh, that it's, that it's working, which is great. So, so my question to you then, Pete, is you know, often I'm, I'm kind of back in the, in the product area of Mashable. You know, how, how has a technology like this, you know, whether it's at Mashable or it's at other companies using other kinds of technology, how, how does this kind of technology uh, affect the newsroom? So I think what's important about like, using tech in the newsroom is it's just an assist, right? So what we're trying to do is take um, anything that's very repetitive and a lot of work. You know, A lot of our editors, uh, you spend a lot of time going through Twitter feeds, going through Facebook, seeing what, you know, what's upcoming, um, you know, where's the breaking news. And I think if you can kind of use technologies and assist and focus your journalists on the more difficult stuff, whether that's the more creative stuff, whether that's tracking down their own unique leads, and take a lot of this um, uh, easier, lighter weight stuff that can be automated and really use the technology as an assist to make them better. I think that's really where you want to use it. Um, you know, you say our homepage is definitely algorithmically driven, but we have overrides where editors can step in and hit the big red button because this story is the most important one right now. Um, you know, and if there's any breaking news today, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll hit the button and it'll be the editor's choice right. about what goes on the homepage versus the algorithm. So, um, and you know, the Kodiak thing is the same thing. 
The algorithms can tell you that that page is the hottest page on the internet right now. They can't tell you the why, right? And that's why you need people in there. And I think the future model is always going to be a hybrid model where technology does some of the easy stuff, some of the lightweight stuff, the repetitive stuff, and the journalists need to do the, either the creative stuff or the really smart stuff. Right, and I've never seen technology actually be able to create a story well. I've seen some experiments in sports as well as market coverage, but beyond that, I don't think we have technology that could actually write a story, nor would we want to, because it takes a human to really create something. And when we talk about creating stories at Mashable, we do both short form and long form content. Mm -hmm. You know, just, I'd love to pick your brain on what, what do you think the right mix is of long form and short form content? What kind of future does each have on the web? Um, you know, just get your thoughts around that. Yeah, so people used to say, like, um, you know, people were worried about this trend with social media spring up that everyone would suddenly have a really short attention span and that everything would have to be shorter and that uh, a lot of news would become kind of commoditized in that sense. What's interesting as more of that springs up is what has value in any system is what's rare, right? So increasingly people find uh, you know, long form opinion pieces, features, uh, breaking news has always been good if you have a scoop. Um, they're finding more value in those, right? So I think there's a, there's a pendulum that swings and I think you need to have uh, the short form stuff is great and people will read it and it's fantastic, but you also need to have a voice and that's where opinion comes in. And you need to have something unique and I think that's really where the value is going to be. And it's the same with the business model. I mean, our advertisers come to us and they want to support content that is deep and thoughtful and in-depth and unique to us. Um, you know, that's really the stuff that brands want to be associated with is the high quality stuff. So uh, I think you're going to see a hybrid model where, yes, there is um, a lot of lightweight stuff that is kind of snackable, and there's also uh, the more valuable stuff that you spend more time on and that actually brands are incredibly interested in supporting and having you create more of. Well, let's keep talking about that then, because I think what brands are doing on the web and how they interact with publishers is fascinating. So, so there's a lot of trends that we see becoming really big in 2013, obviously. Real-time marketing, programmatic ads, uh, native advertising. Um, and, and, and how do you see that mix playing out in the next year? And, and how does a publisher really kind of step back and say, you know, what, how should we allow programmatic advertising on our site? How do we play in, in real-time marketing in, in those sorts of decisions? Sure. So I think what we're trying to do is um, we've always had custom content, which we call it. It's branded content. It's got a million names. Uh, people call it branded content. And essentially that is it's kind of an old-school model, right? It's just a brand comes to you and says, we're really passionate about Topic X. BMW comes to us and says, we're really into innovation. Whenever you cover innovation, we just want our branding around it. We want people to know we support innovation. And we'll create a series on that. Um, and I think that's kind of the way it's always been. It's just that it's gone beyond kind of a channel level where we'll buy out all your tech stuff and we want something more focused. And the reason they want that is because, you know, if you're BMW with the new electric car, you want people who are pro-innovation to, to know about your car, to know that you're an innovative brand. Um, so in a way, everything's changed. In a way, it hasn't changed at all. And it's kind of um, it's new ways of doing stuff that we've always done. I think what that does, though, is get publishers out of the pure volume race, right? which right. Um, you want to have unique stuff. You want to have stuff that's valuable and premium. So uh, that's definitely what we're focused on, is creating really premium content for our publishers um, and making sure that that builds an association uh, with the brand that's positive. So, at, at, um, so Pete, the last time Pete and I were up on a stage together was, at the, was a keynote at South by Southwest. And, and one, of the, one, of, one of the main announcements out of that keynote was uh, the announcement of a new advertising type called Social Lift, uh -huh. right? which was made in a response to uh, you know, uh, 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 the tech companies. Big, you know, five of the uh, five uh, companies that are often thought of as tech companies uh, will own 68% of the display advertising revenue. Uh, uh, this year, you know, when we look at stats like that where this whole pie of display advertising dollars seems to be getting smaller and smaller as it leaks either to tech companies or even to e-commerce companies that are starting to show banner ads, you know, first what, talk us through what Social Lift is, that unit, but then how does Social Lift position, you know, um, uh, uh, Mashable itself to, to kind of deal with these challenges? Yes, yeah, so Social Lift we invented, wow, was that March? That yeah, it was. Ages ago. It was. Um, Social Lift is basically like, so we have this visual homepage and we have all these tiles and stuff. And the idea is that, you know, when we create 
uh, branded content. That's our editors creating stuff. The brands really don't get any say about what's in there. Social Lift is about, well, hey, brands are already creating a lot of content out on the social web. They're creating images for Facebook. They're creating YouTube videos. Um, they're creating vines. And, and in some of those cases, that, that's incredibly compelling content that we might even cover editorial editorially because it's so compelling. So, you know, I like a lot of the marketing from people like GoPro, right? They do all these videos. I'm sure Google Glass will have amazing marketing as well where, you know, you can have these amazing snowboarding or surfing or skiing videos. Are you going to... This it, it creeps me out. Yeah, I just... I don't... If you mention it, you have to wear it. It's yeah. like a... <laughs> it creeps me out when you're wearing it because I don't know what you're doing. Um, wow. Um, so... The idea with Social Lift is basically you take their assets and you put them into the stream, and it's disclosed as you know created by this brand. Um, can I get? Am I going to get Mashable updates on here? Or something <laughs> yeah. Although um, I think the battery died, which might be a problem with Google Glass when it comes out. Um, so the idea of that is basically any visual media they're creating, whether that's videos, vines, uh, you know, images for their Facebook tweets, anything can essentially be promoted on our homepage, it's disclosed. But the great thing about that is it's very shareable content, right? So it's the kind of stuff you'd want to view and share anyway. And we put a really strong filter on that, that like, would we actually cover this you know, naturally? Is this something that our audience would want to engage with and share? And we actually reject a lot of stuff for, uh, for that placement, because we want it to be the most compelling content. Right. Right. So, so switching gears, but staying on the social, social networking side, um, you know, when you step back and look at Mashable, right now we have 25 million monthly uniques, over 11 million. You could, couldn't keep them on, could you? No. <laughs> 11 million followers across social networks. Um, and I know that you, you credit a lot, of, uh, a lot of the early success to being one of the first brands on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, when Twitter was first growing, you know, the, there was kind of a big uh, uh, rising tide. Um, do you think with, with this almost, it almost feels like a saturation of social networks across our personal lives, mm -hmm. is, that, is that opportunity still around for new publishers? Is there another Twitter that's going to come out and, and raise up? So I think there's always the opportunity, but the new thing never looks like the old thing, right? So you're not going to have that same arc happen. I think that era when I started was like, personal blogs where you'd set up a WordPress, and there were a few popular blogs at that time covering technology. Um, so what happens next is going to be completely different, I think, just like um, the fact that the media companies that were successful in that era targeted social. The media companies coming out today will probably be apps first or mobile first, because that's where the biggest growth is. Social, while it's still growing very quickly, uh, it's not the place to start um, necessarily a brand new company and just ride that wave, it's really, you've got to have that mobile element as well now. Right, right. Build stuff for Google Glass, build the news organization for these smaller devices, whether that's the watch, maybe Apple will come out with them, maybe Samsung, build for Google Glass, build for the, for the newest of the new, um, because, uh, you know, that's really where you can compete and where it'll take existing media companies a while to really figure out a natural product and natural fit, whereas new companies can build stuff that's really organic to those platforms. So, so speaking of Twitter, I know that um, a lot of us, and, and actually the way that I got to know Mashable before, before you and I started working together, was actually seeing uh, Pete's face on Twitter with every single Mashable tweet. Uh, does anybody, anybody follow Mashable like out there? You raise your hands. Now, everybody, so everybody sees Pete, whether they're in the morning checking Twitter or at night checking Twitter. Um, but Pete, you have an uh, announcement when it comes to that. We do. So Avatar. people ask, this is what people ask yeah. me all the time. And I finally get to say yeah. that um, we will this week be evolving our Twitter <laughs> avatar. We'll be, because Mashable's been, it started out with my personal account right on Twitter. Yeah, and um, I'm going to give these back now. Yeah, here. sure. Nobody steal them. <laughs> um, we're going to have someone just rush the stage with us. Um, yeah, so it started out with my personal account. I was in San Francisco and I was tweeting like, you know, I'm having a turkey sandwich or whatever. And people would like, I retweet or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then after a while, it became you heard clear it here. that Mashable started with food porn. Yes. <laughs> um, and then after a while, it became um, you know, clear that people wanted to, to see Mashable stories there and that Twitter was becoming a way of sharing links. I mean, it wasn't to start with. It was a way of saying what you were doing. And they changed the prompts on the update. Mm -hmm. So after a while, I started just sharing Mashable links. And then Mashable grew. And we're you know, now over 100 people here in New York and um, many, many journalists contributing to the site. And um, you know, 25 million plus readers. So uh, one of the things we're doing this week is we're going to be changing. Finally, the avatar will no longer be uh -oh. me. It's going to be uh, it's going to be Mashable, a new Mashable <laughs> logo, which you'll see later this week. 
Um, and the reason that we're doing that is because we really feel like it has to represent all of Mashable as a brand. It's clearly grown beyond a personal blog. It's clearly something that uh, we have many great writers on the site, and we really want to uh, you know, represent that movement to being you know, a, a me medium-sized media company that's growing into a large media company. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. It's great. So, so uh, stay tuned to your Twitter feeds and, and look at the site. We're going to be making some changes there over the next week. Uh, but that's all the time we have, Pete. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to take these. There we go.